Welcome to Thinking Through Autonomy, a podcast to help you understand the promise and impact of autonomous land and air vehicles in our world. I'm Ken Dunlap, managing partner of Catalyst Go, taking you on this journey. Hear and read more at thinkingthroughautonomy.com. Now it's time to take your hands off the wheel, foot off the pedal, hand off that throttle, and let's go. Hi, we're talking today with John Coyle. He's one of the world's leading experts in innovation and design thinking. He's author of Design for Strengths, founder of the Design Thinking Academy. He was the head of innovation for a Fortune 500 company, frequent TEDx speaker, and uh, by the way, an Olympic silver medalist in short track speed skating. We'll be talking to him about design thinking, fostering individual strengths, and team strengths over the course of the next couple of podcasts. Welcome to Thinking Through Autonomy, John. It's great to have you here. Great to be here, Ken, and nice to be on the show. Yeah, thank you. So the, the first topic we got to talk about are these crazy things called Maruga scorpion peppers. Let, let's cut to the chase. I understand that they're dangerous. You can remove uh, paint from airplanes, and you can also <laughs> weld metals together with this. What in the world do you serve these things in? Tell us more about this hobby of yours. So I grow them, yes, and they are the world's hottest chilies. Um, they're constantly evolving. Um, but the thing about the chilies is this this thing. If you think about a green pepper, green pepper has no heat, but it has very little flavor. You think about jalapeno, it has some heat, some flavor. Habanero has a lot of heat, a lot of flavor. And what's true about these chilies is that the hotter you go, go up, the more flavor there is. And so really it's about how do you meter out a small enough amount of these things to get the flavor without killing yourself. But yeah, they're dangerous. I mean, uh, a jalapeno has 2,000 Scoville units. A Maruga scorpion pepper has 2.5 million. So we're we're definitely talking orders of magnitude here. Yeah, okay, but what do you serve that in? I mean, is this uh, chili? Is this uh, pass around a plate? What's the best recipe for these peppers? So here's the metaphor. I mean, think about a world without salt. And you never had salt, and you ate your eggs, and you ate your everything without it. And then one day you found salt. I put it on literally everything like every meal every time a shaving of a trinidad maria scorpion pepper goes on top now i've seen on youtube a couple of videos of people essentially passing out and then ems being called <laughs> now, now i gotta ask you this do, do you get your olympian friends over and kind of say you really think you're a tough medalist show me what you got <laughs> take a couple of these peppers and then you watch them cry what <laughs> do you do that there has been the occasional moments, and it's usually, for, for whatever reason, it's usually a tall, bigger fellow that decides they're going to take a bite, and I try to stop them. I do. I really do. Um, but every once in a while, somebody will take an entire bite of one of these things, and then they're down for the count for quite some time. You don't see them for about a half hour. And uh, folks, just uh, go to YouTube and take a look at Maruga Scorpion Peppers, um, and you'll see what John and I are talking about. We got to get serious here for a minute because this is a show about innovation and autonomy. And I want to talk to you um, about a couple of things that you present in your book, Design for Strengths. One of the things that caught me as I was reading your book, you said, high achievers often have a programmed inability to let go, even when there might be a better path forward. And I want to ask you, what does that mean? And then talk a little bit more about that. But what, what do you mean by that, John? So if you think about most high achievers, the, the common narrative, the most common narrative you'll hear is perseverance. And, and perseverance is, is a lovely thing uh, until it's not. I mean, I love the way Scott Adams from Dilbert puts it, <clears throat> that persistent, persistence is awesome until it's stupid. And that's really what I'm talking about is we are programmed, particularly high achieving children, I would say, are programmed from youth. We're actually that's the right word. It's 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 um, operant conditioned to never quit, and and that's really good because kids will quit stuff, right? You quit basketball. You can't be good at anything in a week or two weeks. So we're programmed to never quit stuff. But the problem is, at some point, that programming takes over, and whatever we've latched on to at eighteen or nineteen or twenty or twenty two or twenty three, we stick with because that's what we know. And we never get a chance to see to the left and right what possibilities, what 
native talents might we have used if we had just been willing to let go for a better grip and try something else. When you say program, is this the nature versus nurture debate? Is this something that's you know inherent with us just because we're a human being? What, what's that programming we're talking about? Well, it's, it's facets of two things. I think the programming is what coaches and parents and everybody in our lives has taught us, which is to never quit. Um, and you just got to work harder and put in your 10,000 hours. And that's a really great advice uh, for kids. But we do, and I feel very strongly about this, we all have natural talents. I mean, Anders Ericsson would suggest that all you have to do is put in your 10,000 hours and it doesn't matter what you choose. But I think most of us know intuitively there's just some stuff I'm not good at and I'll never be good at. I will never be a great singer no matter how much car karaoke I do. I have no endurance. I'll never be an endurance athlete. doesn't matter if I put in 10,000 hours to try to become a marathon runner. I'll never be good at it. But I do have some native talents. And if I can figure out what they are, then that's where it place our energies. And this ability to sort of let go of whatever it is you're pursuing to find the better route forward, that's really at the core of the book. How do you design your life to lean into and design for your strengths? And can we talk a little bit about that better path forward? I mean, is that more money? Is that more convenience? Is that less stress? What should we be thinking about when we think about that better path? Oh, Ken, I love you. You set, you set that, that uh, volleyball up so well for me, I'm going to go ahead and spike it. I don't think it's any of those things. Oh, I think that it's... hurts. That hurts, John. <laughs> no, Do you no, know how long a... I prepped for this show? <laughs> I think it's time. Ultimately... Time is our primary currency. It do, money doesn't matter. Time is your currency to spend your existence, your fleeting short existence on this planet with the people you love in the way that you choose. Money is a way to buy time. That's all. So I'm going to ask you to hold that thought because I think the idea of time and what you're talking about, about experiential time and the relative time that we have, I want to spend a lot of time on that um, a little bit later when we talk. But I want to maybe take you back to the beginning because I find your life absolutely fascinating. You're in the eye of all of these changes, you know, whether it's changes in sports, whether it's changes in design thinking, whether it's changes in management philosophy, and, and you kind of find yourself in the eye of this. But I think it all goes back to, to Stanford. You, you're a Stanford grad. You're the kid from West Bloomfield, Michigan. And you look to the West and you say, I need to go to Stanford. So what is this young... 17, 18 year old boy from Bloomfield thinking when he says, I got to go to Stanford? Yeah, great question. Now, that's true. I have sort of forced Gump to my way through life. I'm not sure how that happened, but, uh, you know, I got in really, you know, like people are like, oh, so why did you go there? And the question, the answer is always the same. If you get in, you go. Like nobody gets in. Uh, but when I was there, I, you know, I thought I was smart until I got there. And then, and then I found the real world and, and really struggled. Like I, had so much trouble just getting B's and C's my freshman year, and even a D, which I'd never seen ever. But as I you know, move forward, I was trying very hard to become a mechanical engineer. And my sophomore year, I was taking a class, Math 202, which is linear algebra, which to this day, I still don't know what that is. Uh, me and... neither. I was a, a math major for a <laughs> short time. God, what is that? I still don't know. I, and... I failed it. I got a 13% on the midterm where the professor declared that the lowest score was 46%. So I, I not only had the lowest score in the class, I had the lowest by a third. And that moment is actually incredibly liberating because I walked out of the midterm realizing I can't and won't be a mechanical engineer. I can't and I won't. And I failed for all the right reasons. I didn't fail for the wrong reasons, which is not putting in the time or energy or caring and all those things. I failed because I'm just not good at theoretical math. And that day, I decided I would change my major, and I found the closest adjacent that was still engineering, keep my parents happy, and I found this thing called product design, declared that a few weeks later, and a few weeks later, I was uh, given my new academic advisor, which was a guy named David Kelly, who was Steve Jobs' right-hand man for 20 years, an amazing designer, head of Stanford's D School, and he is also the father of something called design thinking, and that failure actually changed my life in the most spectacularly good way possible. Let's talk a little bit about really your classmates, because I think this is an interesting time at Stanford. So if you looked around the campus, and I don't know if you knew these people, but Reed Hastings, who goes on to found Netflix, is there. Reed Hoffman, 
founder of LinkedIn is there. Peter Thiel, co-founder of PayPal. I don't know, maybe you went to the lunchroom with him. And, you know, Mary Barra, CEO of GM, another person, you know. And this is before the, the time, and I know you teach right now, and I want to compare maybe what you saw on Stanford to what you're seeing today, because I think today, if you look at the, the typical person who sits in a university classroom, they say, my job is going to be, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to change the world and go public, and my first company will be a unicorn. Was that right. the flow back at Stanford? Is it a fair characterization of what you're seeing in the classroom now? How, how does that compare? And we're not talking that many years between the two experiences. Yeah, it was definitely not the flow back then. I would say, I mean, I knew Peter Thiel. We, we, <laughs> there, was a, there was a meeting for the college Republicans, and, and three of us showed up. Uh, me, <laughs> okay. Peter, me, Peter, and my roommate, Jay. Uh, that's how uh, the cam campus was slanted back then. And it wasn't that it was highly political, um, but I wanted to belong to something. So that's how I met Peter, and we spent some time together. But, you know, most of us were, at that time, seeking that thing that was still the norm, which was that great corporate job that paid really well and was safe with benefits and, and, and all of that stuff. The fact that the world emerged and created this possibility for... Um, drastic and significant change afterwards. There was just some people that really latched on to that. And Peter definitely was one of those people. Now, you said that uh, you eventually became a uh, product design and engineering major there. And David Kelly, who we all know, um, as you describe, but also from a little company that's changed the world called IDEO, was your advisor. Sometimes I think that he was the Frank Lloyd Wright of the current age that we have. He's the person who talked about encouraging wild ideas. Uh, this is a quote I love from him. Enlightened trial and error will always succeed over lone genius. And he also mm. said, fail often to succeed sooner. So my question is, again, what makes this kid from Michigan get interested in design thinking at a time when it's probably one of the hottest tech topics out there and at a time when as you wrote in your book, people are telling you you're crazy for going down this path. <laughs> How does design thinking fit in all of that? Well, you know, once I switched the major and started, to, well, I took my first class uh, in design thinking, I was nervous because there was a reputation on campus that these people in this course were, they were eccentric. They were eccentric in sort of two ways. They, they tend to have like a starry-eyed, glazed look in their face always thinking of possibilities and, and, and the next big project, and uh, they didn't sleep, apparently. That's the one thing that was scaring me, is I kept hearing that, that pulling all-nighters was part of this process. That'd be a problem. But once I, once I took my first class, I was completely hooked. This, this inner mesh of, of art and design and visual thinking and this rigorous scientific mindset sitting behind it that, you know, the design, the designer's mindset is a really special, rare thing. And, it, and it's, it's so counterintuitive for most people. And here's the way I would describe it is most people sort of, I, I would say, subscribe to what I would call a mash between Occam's razor and Maslow's hammer. So Occam's razor is that the simplest solution to any given problem is probably the right one. And that's true. A lot of the time, it's just not true for complex problems. And the other is Maslow's hammer, which is if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And this is the way most people solve problems. They see a complex problem. They look for the simplest solution. They go after it with a hammer, and they just whack and whack and whack away. And, and oftentimes it doesn't work. And then they're frustrated, and they get nowhere. The, the designer's mindset is the opposite. It's like, okay, let me look at this complex problem. What is other solutions, complex solutions, different ways of thinking about it, completely analytical and detached, scientific, empirical-looking observ observation and then only when they finally come up with a solution that is unique and different and comes from a different angle do they finally break out Maslow's hammer and go after this thing with all the passion of their humanity and use you know, human-centric design thinking to solve for it. That's, that, to me, is the brilliant lesson that David sort of helped encapsulate. But there was another influence in your background, and that was the late Rolf Fast. And uh, he's the father of the pursuit of art and engineering that we were talking about. If you compare what Rolf added to your academic career and look at what David did, 
where do they complement each other? Where do they send you in, in different directions? How do these two titanic leaders of the current generation of design kind of affect where you are right now? Rolf was a huge influence for me. I actually did have him for an academic advisor for a year as well. Rolf was really, for me, at least during my period, was all about the visual thinking aspect of design. How do you take ideas that are transcribed to you verbally and turn them into pictures? So I learned how to do, you know, drawing. I learned to draw things. I learned to draw problems. I learned to draw perspective uh, perspective drawing. I learned all of that and how to take things that were verbally handed to me and make them into pictures. And, and in so doing, you unlock that part of your brain, that visual thinking, that right brain thinking that allows you to make those lateral leaps to solving problems in new ways. And that's really the gift that Rolf gave me. And while you're walking on campus and, you know, the names Ralph and David come up, are they viewed with the same kind of awe as we view them now as we look back a few years and, and we take a look at what's happened to Apple and why we don't have beige boxes on our desks anymore? <laughs> Did you know how important these people would be to technology in the 21st century? I mean, definitely not. But there was definitely some level already of awe for with these two gentlemen, um, they'd already made a name for themselves in the space of design. David had uh, DK Design or David Kelly Design, which was uh, you know already working for Apple and doing an amazing, uh, doing amazing things. So there was some sense that this is a special environment with a special group of professors and teachers. But you know, fast forward 20 years, and now you look back and you're like, wow, like how lucky, and that's the right word, how serendipitous was I to happen to just fall into that nest just at that right time at the right place well i'd like to think it was keen insight on your part i mean people <laughs> people don't fall into things like this i mean they're, they're, to become part of a movement like this I, you know i got to think that there's something internally that's been there from the beginning that's going to move you but you know that is for a different show on the psychology of innovation and creativity which this one is not but speaking of that at stanford you were introduced to this place called an imaginarium mm-hmm Kind of fill us in. What is an Imaginarium? What did you do in these things? And uh, then I've got some follow-on that I want to talk about, about if we're doing today's Imaginariums right or wrong. Yeah, so the Imaginariums are really a key part of the design thinking, the uh, product design course. Before most of the classes, whether it was ME 101, which is visual thinking, or moving on to ME 202 or 303, um, there was an option. It was optional, but most people, I would say, did it to show up an hour before, go into this. They had this geodesic dome. I think it was built out of foam core, and somebody would either read or sometimes play a recording of these visual journeys. It really was a form of progressive relaxation, but really it was about opening up your right brain to visualizing an entirely unreal world where you would follow the narrative and imagine things that had never been created in, in the history of the universe. And in so doing, unlocking that capacity to tap into your right brain, your creative brain, your visual brain. And then you show up to class and we start to talk about a problem and suddenly you're using that part of your brain that's really good at thinking laterally, that's visual in orientation and suddenly possibility emerges that usurps and comes over your left brain, which tends to be uh, analytical and rigorous and linear. And so that was a big part of that process. And I think the world now is just now sort of returning to this, these sorts of things you keep hearing in Silicon Valley of, of sort of the adjacent equivalent happening in business today. But there's a long space in between where nobody was doing this, I think. Yeah, but don't we see an equivalent? I mean, it's it's the room in the tech startup that has the beanbag chairs, the free mm -hmm. cafeteria. You know, all, all the, the scooters that you can ride through the um, building. But to me, that kind of seems more that it has entertainment value rather than innovation value. So are you saying we need to go back to that original concept and we need to leave the beanbag chairs behind? Yeah, you know, I think that's all fine. Those are good. It's The environment matters. And, and having a, a, an environment that, that sort of cues up freedom to think left and right is good. Um, but the Imaginariums are very specific in their 
their context and their creation is they were designed for helping people unlock themselves from the left brain linear thinking mindset. And that tends to dominate our lives because, you know, you got to get to the plane on time. You got to get to the train on time. You got to get to your commute on time. Like linear thinking is very effective for basic uh, logistics. It's just not very effective for problem solving. Now, at Stanford, we keep talking about design thinking. Or, or, you know, they had a specific view of what design thinking looked like, and it was a six-step process that I'm sure you probably had to memorize from the back of the book. And I just want to familiarize our listeners with that process and maybe go through a couple areas that I guess I find of particular interest that I'd like to get some thoughts from on you. But that's a process where if you're going to create something new, you go through a process called accept and define and emphasize and ideate and prototype and test. And what occurs to me is those things seem kind of natural. But right. you, you pointed out in your book that maybe it's hard for us to accept that we actually have a problem. Why is that? And why does maybe this process break down at the very first step before you get to, you know, two through six? That's so true. So yeah, six step process. Sometimes it's five, sometimes it's four, times sometimes it's seven. But it's it's an iterative process. It is like you said, it's very natural for the most part to think about. But like you said, the first step, accept, accepting you have a problem is it's actually really core. Like you can't solve a problem you're not willing to have, as Dave Evans from Stanford puts it. Or the other way he says is. If the problem you're having is with your problem, not your problem, then that's the problem. So if you if you don't want to accept that you have a problem, well, then you never get to solve for it. And you know, we'll get to this later. But you know, as an athlete, I didn't want to accept that I was a poor aerobic athlete. I didn't want to accept that. And until the day I accepted it, I couldn't possibly solve for that problem. So this is true in government. It's true in politics. It's true all over the place. If you don't accept that you have a problem, you can't really solve for it. But then, then, go ahead. No, but I was going to say, you know, then let's say we, we make that magical mental leap and we say we have that problem. Don't we then, as you say, have problems trying to define exactly what that problem is? Absolutely. And what we usually do is we try to define it in the simplest, most straightforward way. And that's very useful for simple, straightforward problems. And it's extraordinarily unuseful for complicated problems. And what we see again and again is people will solve a problem that in a specific way, and in so doing, there are catastrophic consequences downstream uh, from solving that problem the way they solved it, and they can't see the entire system's view. This is, you know, design thinking incorporates systems thinking for sure. And so, you know, you get things like, um, you know, how do we reduce the burgeoning uh, overweight problem of the U.S.? Oh, well, let's eat less fat. That makes perfect logical Maslow's hammer sense, except it was as it turns out, exactly perfectly wrong advice, and we made the entire universe fatter um, by encouraging a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. Mm. So that's that's an example of defining the problem poorly. Then, and here's the part that is missing in most other sort of intuitive creative problem-solving processes, is are we solving the problem from the perspective of the person we're solving for? Most often, this is a customer in the terms of the business. But, you know, <clears throat> I'll give you a specific example here. I work with an airline company, I won't say their name, but they worked really hard for a few years to solve a problem that was defined for them, which was they spent too much time typing on the keyboard with their customers trying to check them in and, and handle various logistics. And so they created a new system, and they replaced the old system with a system that was faster and more efficient. And this was a great solution to a problem that was not actually the problem. Because what they found also in that place is that the eye contact with the customer went down from maybe 50-50 to like 10%. So suddenly they're actually not connecting with their customer. And even though the process got faster, they actually pissed off their customers even faster than before because there was no human interaction. So again, you get back to whose problem are you solving? Are you solving yours to do this faster? Are you solving your customer's problem who wants a connection and wants to understand that you're actually working for them? So that's where the empathy piece is so, so, so important. But part of me says that if you look at our world right now in 2019, empathy is something 
that may not be a common cultural value anymore. I mean, if, if you view it, you know, in terms of an interpersonal activity, I mean, sure, there's a design activity that says, let's put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and figure out why we're typing too much and why we don't have eye contact. But do you think that there's a basic problem that designers may have that empathy might not be something that they culturally connect with? I, I think that's very true. I think it's particularly true in the U.S., actually. Um, we're so much on broadcast mode, right? We all have an opinion. We want to share it. And and just listening and observing and staying quiet is almost like anathema these days. But the power of it, I think it's actually in this process, it's the most powerful step. When you can truly understand from the shoes of the person you're solving for, what their challenge is, only then can you create a solution that's meaningful, valuable, and that will live on. And the last thing I want to talk about on this topic, I want to combine these last two steps, prototyping and testing, uh, parts of the design process that I know you, you, you live and breathe. But what strikes me, if you're in a startup, or and you're in one of these tech companies that's chasing that next round of venture investment, you know, maybe Series A, Series B, Series C, from the outside, it really doesn't occur to me that the venture community is placing a premium on getting the product right. Just creating a, a device, a thing that might maybe be, you know, liked in a potential market. Do you think that this whole cycle of investment minimizes the importance of prototype and testing and somehow we're getting this wrong and, and maybe these tech startups are not putting out the right products because they're chasing the wrong thing? I think that's perfectly possible. You know, that <clears throat> the trick here is in the ID8 prototype test cycle is this weird, we talked about before, the designer's mindset. There's a <clears throat> Doing it right requires a very weird uh, inversion of normal human capacity, which is you want to be incredibly passionate about testing, prototyping, and finding whether your solution, your application, your idea works. And then you have to completely back up and get totally dispassionate and scientific about, okay, what didn't work? Why didn't it work? What do we need to throw away? Let's let go Let's let go of this idea or this solution and try a variation. And right now it feels like a lot of times a good idea with a decent solution gets valued and then it gets sort of paid for or shunted off to somebody else who inherits it. And then it dies because it wasn't exactly right. It wasn't perfectly right. It wasn't perfectly empathetic for the solution that they were looking for. And this is where all this you know seed money goes to waste because – they didn't do enough trial, they didn't do enough testing, they didn't do enough prototyping to maximize the idea to its potential, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, John, as we kind of circle to a close on uh, this episode, I want to go back to you know the overall topic of autonomy, because that's why people listen into the show. They, they want to know more about what they're doing um, in terms of thinking about autonomy. And I think this is a really interesting segue, this discussion about the design thinking process, to maybe get your thoughts on designing for autonomy. I, I think one of the great debates right now is, do we need to have autonomous vehicles look like us, work like us, have an interface that looks like us? Or should we trust the vehicles themselves to do a lot more and not let humans essentially get too much involved in the process because what's going to happen is we're going to mess it up. So design for the vehicle, for the operations of the vehicle, not so much for the humans who are essentially at one point only going to be turning the on and off switch. Where's your thinking going on that? On, on what does the future need to look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a complicated one because I think there are people with different different needs out there and, and a one size fits all solution probably will not work. I can speak for myself. I want the on off version. Like I don't want to have to think about it. I, I want to do work. I want to be productive. I want to sleep. I want to 
just whistle, have it show up, get in, lay down, work, have myself at the steps of the building I'm going to without any security lines, any worries, controlling all of my music, having the experience for me being totally seamless. But there are others that I know will have worries about, is this thing safe? Does it know what it's doing? Where's my set of controls if I need to take over? Like That's going to be a mixed bag and maybe maybe we have this already in terms of um you know like uh, driver's ed right like the driver's ed driver the, the 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 teacher has a second set of of controls to usurp the student and maybe maybe that's some sort of variation but at the end of the day i think the ultimate solution needs to solve for not just one segment of the population but for all segments what brought up this question is you probably saw this about two weeks ago. There was a designer of autonomous cars who decided that the cars needed to have two large eyeballs on the front that essentially <laughs> showed people who were walking near the vehicle which way the sensors were looking. And so not to criticize that, because I'm sure that this company spent millions of dollars going through that design, I just wonder in the back end, do we need to have cars with eyeballs? Do we need to have drones with eyeballs? Um, that's going to be out, but I'm sure that the design thinking process is going to result in the solving of most of those. What you I, know, I, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, John. So I did. I actually now I remember that article, and I remember having a very visceral reaction to that, which is, boy, a bunch of people are going to think that's silly, but for me, it's brilliant. And here's why: I'm a cyclist. And biking these days, particularly, is a very, very dangerous thing. It didn't used to be, but now with texting and all these other distractions, um, being on the roads can be extraordinarily dangerous, life-threatening. I've had a number of friends killed, even one just two weeks ago, oh, no. um, by cars. Oh, no. And the big rule of thumb in the cycling community is when you're at an intersection, you have to make sure you get eye contact. Because if you don't get it, then you don't know if that car is just going to arbitrarily run through the light or turn right on you or do whatever. So eye contact is essential to the safety of a cyclist on the road right now. And so if a car that no longer has a driver has the ability to demonstrate eye contact, I think it actually is really smart that will, at least for cyclists, uh, um, will demonstrate that there's intelligent thought behind the next movement of that vehicle. Does that make sense? No, that ma makes a lot of sense. And quite frankly, I didn't think of it that way. I, I was just thinking about these big bug eyes on the front of the vehicle to give it a <laughs> friendlier look as opposed to, you know, maybe the science of helping other vehicles not crash into it. Um, this episode of Thinking Through Autonomy is coming to a close. In our next episode with you, John, should you decide to come back and should uh, we have not scared you away, we're going to talk about individual and team performance, and I hope that you'll join us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken.